Hi, everyone, and welcome to our end of year webinar on the California Privacy Rights and Enforcement Act, or California Privacy Rights Act, or CPRA, as we'll call it for today. I'm Justin Yetter, an associate who specializes in data privacy in the Los Angeles office of McGuire Woods. And I have the pleasure of being joined today by several of my McGuire Woods colleagues. They are Bethany Lukic, a partner in our Los Angeles office, Ali Bayardo, a partner in San Francisco, Scott Frain, SVP of Government Relations with McGuire Woods Consulting in Los Angeles, Anthony Lay, associate in San Francisco, and Neelan Takar, also an associate in San Francisco. 2020 was a year like no other, and one that many of us are probably glad to be nearing the end. But there are going to be parts of 2020 that will be with us for years to come. And one of those is the CPRA, which is scheduled to take effect in January 2023 and is the subject of today's webinar. Without further introduction, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, today, I'll start by providing an overview of the CPRA, where it fits in the California privacy landscape and some of the key ways that it differs from the CCPA. We'll then move to a panel discussion to dig deeper into some of the more nuanced issues raised by the new law. I have some questions for the panel to get us started, but would certainly welcome questions from the audience as well. So please feel free to submit those via the chat function, either um, during my portion of the presentation or if something occurs to you during the panel, that would be fantastic. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Privacy law in California can be conceptualized as something like the pyramid shown here. The California Constitution is at the broadest level and declares that all Californians have a right to privacy. The next layer down um, is our general data privacy law, currently the CCPA, which applies to all consumers, all industries, and any business that meets certain size requirements. And then more specifically, we have a number of sectoral laws that govern specific industries and practices. So for example, laws governing medical information or financial information, credit reporting, data breaches, data disposal, et cetera. The CPRA modifies and uh, takes the place of parts of the CCPA. However, it's not actually a wholesale replacement of the CCPA, as some of the provisions and definitions from the CCPA will remain. At the same time, it's also not a replacement for the state's various sectoral laws that regulate privacy. Um, so those familiar laws will also remain in place. Let's take a look at um, the CPRA itself. Um, I'm guessing that many of you probably followed the debate around CPRA, um, which was Proposition 24 on the November ballot um, during the, the year or so before its passage. Um, and there was indeed intense debate. Um, they, even among privacy advocates, there was um, some really serious disagreement about um, whether this law should pass. I've uh, pulled up some of the uh, endorsements or um, statements in opposition here, and you can see that even within groups we would typically expect to be in favor of another consumer privacy law, um, these groups were not so sure. Nonetheless, when it came to the election, California voters spoke fairly decisively. Um, the CPRA passed by 56% in favor, 44% opposed. Now, so perhaps that says that Californians were really excited about a new privacy law. Um, but as we all know, sometimes the uh, ballot initiative process is influenced by money. And the spending here was really disproportionate. Um, the proponents of Proposition 24 devoted about $6 million in expenditures to assure its passage. Meanwhile, the opponents um, had spent about $150,000. So, there's about a, a 40x differential between the spending on either side. Um, just as an aside of the um, spending in favor, 99% of that amount was reported to be from Alistair McTaggart, the San Francisco real estate investor and um, key proponent of both CPRA and CCPA. Um, perhaps the most notable thing about CPRA is that it's not going to wholly replace the CCPA. 
Um, it's in addition to many parts of the CCPA, and it keeps in place several definitions, uh, the basic structure of CCPA in terms of how it's laid out. So when I think about how to frame the CPRA versus the CCPA, I think it generally breaks down into three types of changes. So number one would be it creates some new consumer rights. Number two, it creates some new requirements for business. And then number three, it has a hodgepodge of additional changes, a, uh, a potpourri, if you like, for you Jeopardy fans out there. Um, we'll talk about each of these, starting with the new consumer rights. There are several. Um, I've listed some of the key ones here just to get us started. Uh, first, there are new rights surrounding, quote, sensitive personal information. This is a new category that was created by CPRA that was not found in CCPA. And that includes both a right to know what's being collected and used, um, similar to CCPA, um, but also a right to direct businesses to limit the use of sensitive personal information under certain circumstances. There is um, similarly a right to limit some sharing of personal information, which is new to CPRA and was enacted in a pretty clear attempt to give consumers a way to rein in targeted advertising. There's both a right to know um, sharing of personal information and also a right to opt out of that sharing that looks similar to the right to opt out of sales we saw under CCPA. There is a standard 12 month look back period for uh, request to know in CPRA. This again is similar to CCPA, but under certain circumstances, consumers can now request information that will be older than 12 months. And then lastly, there's a right to correct inaccurate personal information, which is um, similar in some ways to the EU right of rectification. And again, is an entirely new right that did not exist under CCPA. As for the new requirements for business, um, there are some new notice requirements surrounding data retention businesses will be required to disclose their retention periods at the time of collection of personal information, or if that can't be determined, they need to provide the criteria that they use to decide how long to retain a particular type of personal information. They also are going to be prohibited from retaining PI longer than reasonably necessary for the disclosed purpose. There's also a really unique structure now um, that is fully formalized in terms of notifying third parties of deletion requests. The CCPA um, called for a business to delete personal information of a consumer upon request, and also to notify service providers. It was a good practice to notify all third parties who receive the information, but that's now a formal requirement. In addition, when those third parties receive notice of a request to delete, they must delete the information and notify any additional third parties with which they shared it. This basically sets up a waterfall that um, will continue through all third parties until the information is deleted. Likewise, there's an increased emphasis on contracts between all entities that are sharing um, or receiving personal information from a business. Uh, there's a new category of persons called contractors, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the panel. And um, between the new contractor category and service providers, um, I think that we'll see that those sweep up most of the um, entities who receive personal information from a business and impose a number of specific requirements, some of which are familiar and some of which are new. And, and again, we'll be glad to get into all of that in more detail when we move to our panel. As you can see, um, there are also new audit requirements and risk assessments um, for what we've called high-risk businesses, just as a shorthand. The actual terminology from CPRA is where the processing presents a significant risk. Uh, there will be more on that in the regulations that are to be promulgated under CPRA. We don't actually know a whole lot of detail at this point about um, what these risk assessments will look like, how exactly they're supposed to be conducted. Um, as with um, a number of other topics under CPRA, we're still expecting even more rules. And then lastly, there is um, a provision calling for the use of automated opt-outs from sales and sharing of personal information to be sent by browser signals. This is set out as an alternative to the do not sell or share my personal information button or link that um, businesses can put on their homepage. 
We'll get into um, many of these, maybe even all of them in more detail during our panel. And of course, are happy to answer questions about all of them um, from our audience. So let's turn to the last category of um, changes. And this is really, as I mentioned, a hodgepodge or uh, potpourri. Um, this is, it, it covers a, a wide range of different details in the CPRA. Um, but also I've put the California Privacy Protection Agency in this category as it doesn't really fit in a new consumer right or a new specific requirement on business. Um, but that is a really significant change. Um, the Privacy Protection Agency or CPPA will be the first solely dedicated privacy enforcer um, in the United States. And its role is going to be both to uh, publish regulations interpreting CPRA and also to enforce the CPRA. Um, it's basically, there's a transitional period for it to take over enforcement from the Attorney General um, and to take over rulemaking. However, the AG will continue to have a role in terms of civil enforcement. Meanwhile, the CPPA will have its um, enforcement conducted through administrative proceedings. Second, there's a change in the threshold requirement for what constitutes a business under CPRA. Uh, the monetary standard, the $25 million in annual revenue has been clarified a bit, but is essentially unchanged from CCPA. However, there have been changes to the other requirements. Most significantly, a business could fall under CCPA if it um, collected, used, or disclosed 50,000 or more um, persons, households, or devices, personal information. Under CPRA, that threshold has been raised to 100,000 records and devices has been eliminated from the definition. So it's 100,000 um, records relating to persons or households. And then likewise, there's been a slight modification to um, the uh, other prong of the business definition. So under CCPA, a business could uh, an entity could qualify as a business if it derives 50% of its revenue from selling personal information. CPRA has expanded that perhaps to include sharing. Sharing is in the definition. I think the question here is whether um, deriving 50% of your revenue from sharing would also be considered a sale. That, that may or may not be a significant change, and we can discuss that um, more as we move into our panel discussion. There's also a um, what we're calling a floor on the protections within CPRA stemming in part from the fact that it was a ballot measure. So any amendments to the CPRA may be made by the legislature by a simple majority, but they have to further the purpose and intent of the CPRA. So for that reason, it seems likely that um, you know many parts of the CPRA are here to stay. The CPRA has also eliminated the 30-day safe harbor for enforcement under CCPA, that um, any opportunity to fix an issue with um, compliance with the law is now left within the, the discretion of the CPPA. And then lastly, um, there's an increased penalty for violations involving children's data. That's now $7,500 per violation, um, so the same as an intentional violation. Before we move into our panel, I just want to orient us in terms of timing. Um, we're now past the election. CPRA has passed. We know it's here to stay, but what's coming next? The, the next major deadline is July 1, 2021, um, which will be when rulemaking may commence. I say may because that's not actually a hard and fast deadline. The CPRA calls for rulemaking to commence on the later of July 1, 2021, or six months after the CPPA gives notice to the Attorney General that it's ready to begin rulemaking. So it's possible that the rulemaking may begin later. Um, it, it's not wholly clear whether that notice from the CPPA to the AG will be something that is publicly announced. Presumably it would be, um, but it may be that we don't hear a whole lot, especially during the first couple quarters of 2021. From there, the next key date will be January 1, 2022, which is um, the date on which personal information collected by a business is going to be subject to CPRA. 
So that's a key date for businesses out there who are working on their compliance now. Uh, they'll want to be ready with um, the mapping of their information um, with respect to sensitive personal information, for example, on that date so that when the CPRA takes full effect a year later, they'll be able to go back and comply with requests. Um, that date is probably the most significant, which is January 1, 2023. The CPRA will take effect on that date. All of the um, rights that are available to consumers will be live. It's also the date when the employee and business to business exemptions expire. So I, I think maybe the best way to think about that, just given that the day expires simultaneously with the act taking full effect, is that those exceptions for employee and B2B data um, are really exceptions from CCPA. By the time businesses are, um, are under CPRA, by the time the law is live, those exemptions will no longer exist. And we can talk about the likelihood that they get extended, but I, I think it's probably fair to say it's low. Um, and then there is another, um, another gap before enforcement will begin, similar to what we saw with CCPA, where the Attorney General held off enforcement for some time after the act became um, effective. So with that, um, let's turn to our panel discussion and we'll get a bit deeper into some of the specific impacts of CPRA. Again, I'll be moderating the panel and I've prepared some questions to get us started, but please do use the chat function to submit questions if you have them, as we'd love for this to be an open discussion with the audience as well. So the first question I have prepared, and we'll just uh, dive right in, is um, basically how did we get here? Um, California now has the distinction of passing not only the nation's first comprehensive data privacy law, but also the second. And frankly, the CCPA probably still feels pretty new to a lot of people out there. There are still some regulations being revised and finalized as we speak, for example. Um, Scott, as our um, government relations expert on the call, um, it, you know, the CPRA had a bit of a, a rocky road to the ballot that involved a lawsuit against the Secretary of State. But um, in general, and for folks outside of California in particular, could you maybe shed some light on how we got here and perhaps talk about the ballot process in general? Sure. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, how we got here is it's a, a rocky road is probably a good way to describe it there is a unique ballot initiative here in california which any citizen or group can propose a law which is known as an initiative draft and then submit it to the attorney general um, the initiative requires at least six hundred thousand signatures in order for you to find your way onto the ballot um, such as the cpra did once those signatures are verified um, you end up seeing it on November 3rd, as we all did here in the state of California. But, you know, going back, the, the CCPA was also originally supposed to be a ballot initiative, and ultimately the legislature decided to frantically come up with a couple of bills uh, to put something forward for the CPRA to eventually come uh, <clears throat> on the heels of. But privacy has been debated in California for the last 30 years. Uh, there have been some minor privacy amendments um, through the tech industry and generally wanting to win some larger battles. This shifted in 2018, in part due to Facebook and Google News stories, which prompted, as you mentioned earlier, Justin, uh, Alistair Mattaggart, a wealthy Bay Area guy, but not necessarily a Sacramento guy, who decided to try to figure out ways that he could be creative and uh, put something like CCPA and CPRA on the table. Um, ultimately, the CP, uh, CCPA was not on the ballot in 2018, and they passed these bills that I mentioned earlier. One was AB 375, the other one was uh, SB 1121. But with that brought a lot, of, uh, a lot of new bills. So in 2019 and 2020, there were dozens of new bills to amend the CCPA. A uh, few of them really succeeded, but it was McTaggart who was trying to figure out how to, to thread the needle uh, with the CCPA and make sure it met the spirit of what he was trying to do, and, and that's protect consumers. Um, so after going through it on, on numerous occasions, the uh, privacy groups ended up splitting, some of them went neutral, and some of them decided to stay relatively quiet and oppose. Um, ultimately, the YES campaign that McTaggart was able to coordinate spent $5 million, uh, as you also mentioned earlier, uh, 
to uh, you know, a, a small amount of money that the opposition campaign never really got off the ground, which paved way for Proposition 24. Um, so it, it was a little bit of a, 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 again, a rocky road is a good way to describe it, CCPA. Um, they thought there were too many holes in it, so you started seeing more bills to try to improve it. CPRA is going to make it very difficult to amend it moving forward. The, the legislature is going to, if they have bills, they're going to have to make sure that, one, they meet the spirit of the law and that they ultimately be defendable in court. So uh, that is a little bit different than what we've seen in normal state bills or state legislature bills in the sense that uh, you can amend from year to year, make some small tweaks here and there. But this is going to be a little bit of a more difficult push for some groups to be successful in because I think it will require both the legislature and a, and a court play. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's, you know, it has such an interesting history, and um, you know, as you point out, it it sounds like it may be somewhat less likely than with some other laws that we see amendments. Um, where it seems like we may see more rules is with respect to the regulations. Um, you know, the the CPRA has a provision within it that calls for regulations on a number of topics. And so, you know, as we're anticipating these being rolled out, uh, perhaps first by the Attorney General, but then by the CPPA, um, Scott, maybe you or, or Bethany can um, give us some insight on what we can expect from the regulations and uh, whether this process is likely to look similar to what we saw with CCPA. So maybe Justin, I can start and then hand it over to Scott. Um, uh, you know, I think that the CCPA's regulation history was different than everybody expected. It was very rushed, um, and the regulations went through a number of different um, changes. And in fact, even after the final regulations went into effect this past summer, we've seen two additional attempts to modify the regs. Um, I think that the CC CPRA regulation process hopefully will be a little bit smoother. Um, the CCPA regulation process was really compressed into a time period of, of nine months from uh, first publication of the regulations last October through again um, this past June when the final regulations and final um, support for those regulations was published. Here with CPRA, we have the benefit of having a set of regulations already in place and a framework already in place for which um, the, uh, the, the regulations to build on. Um, but we also have the advantage of time. Um, I think as Justin alluded to earlier, um, the CPRA regulations are supposed to begin um, next summer in July. Whether that will hold true or not will probably impact sort of the speed and the um, clarity with which these get passed. But um, even assuming rulemaking ends in 2022, that's a full year time period to go through rulemaking. And then there is still really another year after that that tweaks could be made before enforcement begins. So I think we're looking at a two-year time period re realistically than the nine months that we grappled with, with C EPA, CCPA, all of these acronyms are a tongue twister. Um, but uh, I think that hopefully things will look a little bit smoother and um, the invested people and businesses will have more of an opportunity to vet the regulations um, before they come to final fruition. Thanks, Bethany. I'm, I'm going to build on that with a question from someone in the audience um, that I think is probably top of mind for a lot of people listening. Um, and that is, given the timing that we're looking at for rulemaking and then enforcement, um, how should organizations be thinking now about their compliance and timing and the urgency of all that, um, especially when there are plenty of companies out there that are just getting used to CCPA, just getting their CCPA programs up and running. Um, what should they be expecting in terms of timing and what they should be doing over the next um, couple of years before CPRA comes live? Um, I mean, I think the focus should still be right now on CCPA. 
Um, if you're not compliant with CCPA, your focus should be to become compliant with CCPA. I think that CCPA will give you a great foundation for becoming compliant with CPRA. At the same time, I think there are going to be a lot of um, uh, things that we talk about that businesses should be looking at at the same time they're implementing uh, CCPA. And, and those are things that, you know, I think we can all add to and um, give sort of business tips. Um, I think as you prepare for CCPA, you should be, you know, looking at, um, you know, what data you have, how it's used, um, your contracts with uh, third parties, service providers, and be looking at privacy in a more holistic view um, and looking forward to see, um, you know, what changes you might make now in order to make the process easier um, when CPRA enforcement comes along. So I'm sure there are others in the group that have to add to that. Yeah, sure. Would would love to hear from others in the panel, and um, um, specifically, I also want to get to some questions about um, not only comparison between CPRA and CCPA, but also with GDPR. Um, I think it'd be great to dive into that in just a minute. But before we get too far beyond the election, um, we did have a question from the audience about. Um, it, whether we know or have any guesses as to why the industry opposition to CPRA Prop 24 was um, so low, at least from a dollar spent standpoint, um, I don't. I don't personally know. I wish I did. But um, anyone else on the panel um, have any insight into that? <laughs> All right, hearing none. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Justin, I, I can speculate if you if you don't mind um, I would I would without going too too far out over my skis. But I think, you know, <laughs> once you're confronted with uh, you know bills or in this case a ballot like it is, um, it, it is hard to defend some of those positions sometimes because you know I, I've done this from the student data privacy side as well, and eventually they say, well, why are you you know why are you for uh, selling student information and. And there's a lot of nuances there. And so I think the question is, is uh, it becomes difficult for you to say, I'm not for it, I'm, I'm, or, I'm not for it, I'm against it, but here's why. And sometimes the, the why is less important to people once you say I'm, I'm against it. So I just say that as an example. Um, I can't speak to the CPRA directly in that campaign because it just wasn't part of it. But, um, you know, I have seen that happen across other states because uh, it, it does make it tough from an optical perspective sometimes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I, I think, you know, one of the things I did hear about some of the, um, or hear from some of the opposition groups was this um, insinuation that there was some amount of um, basically capture by some of the big tech companies that they were actually involved in um, drafting CPRA in a way that satisfied them, basically by meeting with Californians for consumer privacy and making sure that their interests were represented. Um, so it may be it, it may be a little bit um, buried beneath the surface, but perhaps there was a little bit more industry involvement than might might first appear. Um, so I do want to go back and and talk about um, how CPRA compares to other privacy laws. So we've talked a little bit about CCPA and CPRA, and certainly um, that's the, the main comparison because of how CPRA builds on CCPA. Um, but there are also some comparisons to be made with GDPR. And some of what's been said about CPRA is that it brings California closer to the GDPR. I've even heard that Alistair McTaggart consulted with some European authorities in um, working to draft the new law. Um, Ali or Neelan, perhaps um, one of you or both of you could give us a couple perspectives on some of the overlaps between GDPR and CPRA and which GDPR principles can be seen in how the CPRA is drafted. Yeah, absolutely, Justin. And it's a great question and one that comes up often um, as people are trying to navigate, you know, what are these new California privacy provisions and how do they stack up with what we know already, which was when businesses, you know, rolled out and got compliant with the GDPR. 
The CPRA actually brings um, California privacy law closer than GDPR than the CCPA originally did. Um, for example, the CPRA begins with general duties like um, the GDPR's processing principles. You know, so for example, the CPRA begins with um, you know obligation to use reasonable security um, procedures and practices to protect personal information. Um, I think one of the most obvious examples that stands out to folks with the CPRA is the concept of sensitive personal data. Um, you know, the GDPR has the special categories of personal data that have extra protections. Um, the GDPR categories include data which would reveal your racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, health data, um, and the list goes on. Um, the state PRA likewise has sensitive personal data, which is defined differently, but would include your social security number, driver's license, state ID card, passport number, financial information, login information. Interestingly, geolocation data is included in that. Racial or ethnic origin or religious or philosophical beliefs, et cetera. Um, mail, email, text messages. But interestingly, these heightened protections only apply when it is being used to infer characteristics about a consumer, um, which goes back to the cross-contextual um, advertising we touched on before. Um, so that's a, a nice example of where you know GDPR principles are coming in. Obviously, it's slightly different, um, but that is a, a nice example there. Uh, Neil yeah. is going to share with us another example. Um, yeah, Justin, I would just add that the CPRA also provides a few more GDPR-esque personal rights. And so, you know, currently the CCPA provides consumers with some rights that are broadly equivalent to those contained in the GDPR, but there are some notable omissions. So it does not include the right to rectification, the right to restrict processing, the right to reject automatic decision-making, or the right to object processing. Um, and so what the CPRA does in effect is just introduce all of these other GDPR style rights. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, Neelam. And it, it also, um, you know, it also raises the question of mapping, I think, in a way that um, CCPA um, didn't. You know, it doesn't, obviously CPRA does not call for uh, mapping specifically to be done. Um, but I'd be interested to get your thoughts on why data mapping of particularly sensitive personal information will be important and what are some best practices for how to go about it, in particular for companies that have been through the GDPR process and how these two laws fit together. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, data mapping is really the starting point for privacy compliance. Uh, data mapping is discovering what kind of data you collect, uh, where it's stored, with whom it's shared, how it's used, uh, how long it's retained for. And I know this from my time in house that oftentimes data mapping starts in a spreadsheet. Um, you know, as companies grow larger, this can become increasingly impractical and untenable. Um, but I think that the main thing to remember for data mapping is that it's not a one and done. Um, it really does require continuous upkeep uh, and budget. And so I think it's going to be a critical first step for businesses to understand the data and personal information they're collecting about consumers. And particularly with this new definition of sensitive personal information, um, for businesses to understand whether they are collecting any sensitive personal information. Um, Similar to the GDPR and the CCPA, um, the key to understanding the landscape of sensitive personal information and adhering to uh, laws and regulations for protecting it is to maintain a robust data map. Well put. Um, and I, you know, building again on um, the GDPR, I think that's a, um, you know, a, a very significant point. I think. Understanding your data flows is is going to be significant, um, perhaps even more given the 
uh, potentially heightened level of enforcement that we're going to be seeing and, and questions that businesses may be facing from regulators about how exactly um, personal information is flowing. Uh, with that in mind, um, I'd like to turn to a few questions on the new agency, the CPPA, and also enforcement. Um, so uh, perhaps similar to the European Data Protection Authorities, the CPRA established this new agency that's solely dedicated to data privacy. Um, I think I'll, I'll call on Anthony for this one. Um, but um, Anthony, what can we expect from the new standalone data privacy authority, the CPPA, relative to the current model of oversight that we have in California from the Attorney General? Thanks, Justin. That's a great question. So regardless of how you feel about privacy rights in general, and you touched on this earlier, the new agency, for better or worse, is going to be a big deal because it's the first state regulator that is 100% and entirely focused on privacy. We don't have that anywhere in the United States, and this is going to be the first state that will be able to do that. The budgets also reflect that. So in 2021, they have an allotted budget of $5 million. And for 2022 and beyond, it's a budget of $10 million for 2022 and every single year after that. And that budget is in line with a lot of other California state agencies. So what that means is that we fully expect the agency will become very active after it ramps up. And that means an increase in general compliance and enforcement efforts. In terms of the format in general of the agency, it's going to be a five member board. And the five members are appointed by various different people. The governor, Governor Newsom, appoints the chair and a second member. And for the remaining three members, they're appointed by various different people. So the California AG appoints one individual. The Senate Rules Committee appoints another. And the final board member is appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly. So the five-member board delegates authority, if they'd like, to the chair or to an executive director. And collectively, those two individuals run the day-to-day -day activities of the agency. And in terms of timing, we'd expect that those appointments will be made probably within a couple couple months here. Thanks. Yeah, and speaking of those appointments and you know all the steps necessary to get a new agency off the ground, um, what do you think is the timeline for the CPPA to become fully operational? And and perhaps more significantly, um, what sort of impact on CCPA enforcement should we expect in the meantime? Yeah, in terms of timing, and you've touched on this a little bit earlier, Justin, I, I like to think of it as there being milestones every six months, and that starts with you know, July 1st, 2021. And that is when we're expecting to see that the CPPA obtains authority from the AG to adopt regulation. And six months after that, January 1, 2022, businesses need to start honoring a consumer's right to access personal information collected by business. Six months later, July 1st, 2022, we see that the regs will be finalized, um, which feels like a long time away, but it, it really is around the corner. And in January 1st, 2023, the CPRA becomes in full effect. Um, enforcement is not supposed to start until July 1st, 2023. And the timing of all this, there's some various impacts of on TCPA enforcement. We expect in the meantime that it'll be really business as usual for the California AG on privacy issues until there is going to be a full transition to the CPPA. Um, there might be some potential slowdown and deferring of adoption of more regs to the new agency. Um, and as I mentioned, that's set to occur July next year. Um, but in general, we would expect there to be a lot of collaboration between the two agencies, and there's a lot of different provisions in the CPRA that support that. You know, for instance, the AG is supposed to appoint um, one board member. Um, the AG is also supposed to provide staff support to the new agency until the new agency hires their own staff. And there, there's not supposed to be duplicate and concurrent actions going on by the two agencies. Yeah, thanks. That's that's. Um, I think that's really insightful, and um, you know, particularly in light of the AG loaning um, its staff over to CCPA to get it up and running 
um, it'll be really interesting to see where the overlaps are between the AG's approach and the CCP, uh, the CPPAs. Um, Ali, I know that um, you follow CCPA enforcement um, very closely, um, and there will be some changes under CPRA in terms of procedures and liability. Um, what are some of the most important ones, and what do you expect to be the net impact of all this? That's a, that's a great question, Justin, and I think what's on the forefront of a lot of businesses' minds is you know, what kind of civil liability am I going to potentially be exposed to? Because we all know that California has a very active plaintiff's bar, and that was a great um, point of debate in Sacramento originally with the CCPA to try and limit the scope of any private right of action. Um, and additionally, you know, what we've seen in filings that have come out to date is, you know, creative ways trying to get around that limited private right of action in the CCPA. I'm trying to uh, bootstrap claims onto California's unfair competition law um, in different ways, um, you know, a misrepresentation claim based off of what you're saying on your website, but what you're really doing um, is one we've all been you know, kind of watching for and looking out for. Um, and then certainly there's the unlawful aspect. Um, so the CPRA will have some interesting um, new things to be on the lookout for. Um, so for example, we see two real expansions of the private right of action. Uh, one is that the language in the CPRA now makes clear that a plaintiff can bring a claim based upon a breach of an email address in combination with a password and security question and an answer permitting access to that email account. Now, there's some debate about whether that was already encompassed by the CCPA, but you know, any debate is now set aside since it's now included in the CPRA. And the other very important thing to be aware of is that it removes the automatic right to cure. The CCPA had essentially a safe harbor provision that would allow a business 30 days to cure after a violation after being notified, um, and that is no longer there. Now, the CPA, the agency, will have the discretion to allow businesses the right to cure, but that's no longer um, in the statute for private rights of action. Um, and then, of course, there's the new $7,500 violation laid out in the CP CPRA for intentional violations involving minor uh, consumers. Yeah, so a, a lot of nuanced changes. Um, and I, I think Anthony did a really good job laying out what the AG's role is as the CPPA gets up and running. Um, but the AG will actually potentially continue to have a role in privacy enforcement in California, even after the CPPA is doing its administrative enforcement. Um, Allie, do you or maybe Bethany want to give us some thoughts on how this might work? Um, and in particular, whether we expect to see a similar level of privacy enforcement from the AG to what we're seeing now? Um, if you would, go ahead and read the tea leaves for us, please. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's hard to do so, but we'll do our best. Um, and of course, the tea leaf reading will change if the AG moves to Washington. So that, that will obviously have an impact on, on what goes forward. Um, but, you know, given that the CPPA is only able to enforce that statute, um, you know, we think that really the CPPA PPA will be focused on um, investigations and complaints. Um, and then when we get more into bigger actions that involve other claims, you would you know, see the AG getting involved there. What are your thoughts on it, Bethany? So I don't think that the um, California AG is going to fully turn over the reins completely to the CPPA. I think that um, sort of more regular types of minor violations might be addressed by the CPPA. I also think that the CPPA will be able to support any sort of attorney general regulations with its additional funding and resources. But I think that in larger cases, um, cases of note, cases where there might be um, claims or allegations that cross um, multiple different types of laws within California, that you're still going to see the weight of the California AG's office behind um, 
behind the complaints. I also think that the CPPA is relegated to administrative actions where the California AG is not necessarily so. Um, and so I think that you're going to see these groups um, and entities working in tandem. I think the higher profile cases are likely to still involve um, the California AG. But I think that with the addition of the CPPA, you have a lot of additional resources and assistance um, to the AG's office, which quite honestly right now is, is stretched very thin, um, um, in particular with the various different demands on California's budget that didn't exist of a year ago. So I think that this additional agency just gives the AG greater support um, and it allows the AG to delegate some some matters that it might not have the time and um, ability to deal with to this agency. Very good uh, tea leaf reading. Um, I appreciate that and <laughs> sorry for putting you guys out there. Um, so I do want to turn, we, we've talked a bit about enforcement now. Um, I want to turn to some of the specific issues regarding some of the new provisions that are in the CPRA. And um, first, we've had a, a question from the audience about the, the good news, bad news situation with respect to the employee and business to business exemptions. So the CPRA extended the CCPA's employee and B2B exemptions until 2023. So while this means that they're exempt for the next couple of years, it also means that the exemptions are going to expire the same day the rest of the CPRA comes into effect. Um, Anthony or, or Ali, um, do you want to give us some insights on um, what the impact of that might be? And um, Scott, I'd also be really interested to hear um, your thoughts on whether there's any chance that the exemptions might be extended and what that process could look like. I can start us off with just some, some more context. So CPRA extends the exemptions another year to January 1, 2023. And generally it's it's good news because it gives businesses and entities basically two full years to get up to speed on the TCPA, which was in effect earlier this year, July, 2020, and the CPRA, which is going to be in, fully in effect January 1st, 2023. But obviously it's, it's going to be bad news because these exemptions are going to eventually go away and you still eventually have to apply. Um, luckily, the notice requirements are not that burdensome. So I think I would encourage everyone and all our viewers to, to get a head start on that. Yeah, and I would chime in, like Justin mentioned in the uh, introductory slides, it is, you know, we do have a lot of time and I, I agree with Justin that I don't think it would be extended again. Um, there's obviously a lot to think about in terms of how this touches on your employees, also particularly applicants. Um, but there's also a little bit of difficulty too because we're also waiting for the regulations to come out from the CPRA. So, you know, I think if you're looking towards this, you know, obviously you wanna be CCPA compliant um, and be thinking about how the CCPA works and how that would apply to your, you know, employee uh, handbooks, applicant information, that type of thing, and then kind of layer that on as we get more guidance from the CPRA. Um, but, uh, it, you know, difficult to make sure you're perfectly compliant when you don't yet know what the implementing regulations will look like. So I'm going to chime in here. I think that in, particularly in the employee context that the extension is really designed to allow labor groups and, um, you know, groups typically involved in employee regulations a chance to create its own or a um, an aligning statute or set of regulations dealing with employees. I, I personally don't anticipate that in 2023, the employee rights will look exactly like the CPRA rights are delineated, just applied to employees. I think that there are going to be different regulations that come on board um, and different laws that come on board during this time period to deal with employees. Um, I think that the, that the structure is sort of laid out there in the CPRA, but I think that there have been a lot of negotiations um, so far and a lot of debate um, in this area, and the additional extension gives 
um, time for that legislation to come forward. Scott, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, yeah. in my experience across states and even at the federal level, the, the trickiest situation is when you begin to negotiate exemptions. Um, you know, how do you, com how do you put uh, some companies or organizations in one bucket versus another bucket? So how do you rein in some while giving flexibility to others or allowing them to do business as usual? Uh, I do think, at least in part, this has been one of the biggest sticking issues for the federal government to move forward on some comprehensive legislation in the privacy space. And I know we can talk a little bit about that in a minute, but um, that, that's been my experience is that exemptions are kind of a two-way street. On one hand, it's good and allows you to get to a certain timeline or deadline to change your practices. But on the other, um, it, it would kill some businesses over time. I think there are some who specialize in things and, and they would like to see it continue to occur. And in places like California, they question whether it's, you know, if the juice is worth a squeeze. Thanks, Scott. And I, I do definitely want to get to um, some of your thoughts and others' thoughts on the uh, prospect of federal legislation in a moment. Um, we did have an additional question from the audience related to the distinctions between contractors, service providers, and third parties. Um, it, these are very detailed and seemingly overlapping definitions, at least in the case of service providers and contractors. Um, Bethany, I know that you've spent a lot of time deep in the weeds on this. Um, do you want to give us I your insight? I question on with the plant. <laughs> <laughs> we, we try to add value where we can. <laughs> so I think, um, I mean, this is something that we've all internally studied and tried to figure out for ourselves. Um, and, and I'm not sure that I have the exact right answer on this issue, but the CCPA had sort of two categories. It had third parties and it had service providers. And I think in response to the legislation, um, a lot of people, ourselves included, advised our clients to try and put, um, you know, our vendors and the people that our businesses work with into this category of service providers um, so that you would avoid issues of uh, dealing with sales of, of information. And um, it was a little bit more user-friendly to be a service provider than a third party. So the CPRA really has um, added a layer to that and made it more complicated with the sharing of information. And so they created what I think is this third category contractor to replace um, what we envisioned as a perhaps a third party, but also to deal with issues of are your vendors providing a service or are they providing a contract um, or a product? And there is a difference under the laws of most states as to how you interpret contracts for services and contracts for goods. And perhaps the service aspect of the title service provider was um, uh, impacting counseling in this effect and impacting interpretation of contracts. Um, and so that was why this uh, category of contractor was added. It's basically a service provider in all, sort, in all intents and purposes, but it doesn't have the service aspect to it. The third party, I think, is going to be left for entities that you are um, sharing information under the statute or parties that you are selling information to. Um, and I think that that is going to be, again, geared towards this cross-context behavioral advertising aspect of the statute. That's my best um, interpretation of the three different categories. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and certainly, I'm sure you'd agree, it's going to require some pretty detailed analysis in the case of any new vendors or situations in which personal information is being disclosed outside the organization as to exactly who falls into this category and whether, say, a particular vendor is a, a contractor, a service provider, or a third party. 
Right. And I think it's going to be an evaluation also of are they providing you a service or are they providing you a good or is it a mixed um, type of contract? Um, so we have just a few moments left, um, but I do want to make sure that we talk about both the prospect for legislation in other jurisdictions, um, as well as the potential that we see federal privacy legislation um, sometime in the near future. Um, you know, I, I know that several of us have looked at this, so I'm just going to open up the question um, to, to all of you. Um, but starting first at the federal level, I mean, what are some expectations around what we might see in terms of privacy legislation um, and in particular potential interest by the Biden administration? Um, and do we think that that is going to help prevent a situation where we maybe have 50 different state privacy laws? You want me to jump in on this, Justin? Please. Yeah, please, Scott. Thanks. Uh, so, so maybe let me answer this in two parts. I think the first part is um, we know that there are three states with some version of a, of a consumer privacy law in California, Nevada, and Maine. Um, we know that 23 states have introduced legislation uh, in the privacy space, even just in 2020, uh, most of which, most of those bills were not ultimately passed or entertained simply because of the coronavirus and the shutdown of state legislatures. Um, or their sole focus on all things coronavirus, balancing budgets, uh, ensuring healthcare services, education, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, the reason I think this is important is because the more states that, the groundswell that, of states that begin to get onto a similar CCPA, CCP, or CPRA bill, uh, the more pressure there is gonna be on the federal government, frankly. Uh, this is something we've been dealing with on the federal government side for quite some time. Um, there are already some bills that were introduced this this 116th Congress, so this year in the last two years, um, and we expect we'll see more, you know, in the new calendar year in the 117th Congress. The Biden administration seems like they'd be willing to support something. Kamala Harris certainly has some experience in privacy legislation in both her role as a senator as well as AG in California. Um, I, I think, you know, it's probably not going to be on their top of, of of items to accomplish, at least in the first. 100 days or even a year or so. Um, you know, I, I think they are going to have a laser like focus on things such as the coronavirus, such as the economy, um, energy, climate change, et cetera, could probably lead the way. Um, but I also do believe, too, that it's going to depend on what happens on January 5th in Georgia, uh, the runoff between the two sitting senators in Georgia against some Democratic uh, challengers. And, you know, if that were to happen, if the, if the Democrats were to win, you could, uh, you could ultimately find yourself in a spot where the Democrats would have the White House, would have the House and have the Senate, which would make something a little bit easier for them to move through. I think if you end up having a divided government, so a House that's Democrat and a, and a Senate that's Republican, it will make it more difficult for them to move a large, comprehensive bipartisan bill. Um, we've seen just how hard it is for them to get COVID relief done, which we're expecting to come out this week. Um, but this has been months in the making. We haven't seen anything since the CARES Act in March. Um, and so with so much political will at stake, I do question whether you could get something that would be comprehensive and could ultimately usurp the 23 states that are already entertaining bills uh, and the three that have already, including California. Thanks, Scott. Um, so we're, we're almost out of time, folks. Um, but... Um... Uh, maybe we can do this one rapid fire. Uh, we'll go Bethany, Anthony, Ali, Neelam, Scott. Um, so, uh, and this question is a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, a little bit over two years have passed since um, CCPA. And now here we are with the second comprehensive data privacy law in the US, again, coming out of California. Uh, should we expect a new data privacy law in California every two years? So I'm going to say, well, we've given you lots of coal in your stocking this Christmas. Um, I don't anticipate that we're going to see another big comprehensive privacy statute come out of California. You will see lots of regulations. And I'll just generally say that I'm going to leave Alistair McTaggart on my naughty list just because um, I'm sure he's watching all the, everything going on very closely, and I'm sure he's up to something. I'm going to wish for a visit from the ghost of Christmas future to tell me what the future will bring. <laughs>
I am going to also say that you'll have to ask Alistair McTaggart. And that's mostly because I think that he has kind of like a Bond villain billionaire esque name. <laughs> um. All right, Scott, last word falls to you. Okay, well, I'll do my best. I think um, you know, the pattern would suggest yes. I think pragmatically the answer is probably no. But having said that, I think it does depend on what happens with the regulations under CPRA. If, uh, you know, if they end up being too um, cumbersome or onerous, I, I do suspect that you could run with you know, either new bills or another ballot initiative uh, in, in two to four years. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. Um, you know, we really appreciated the questions and also appreciated the opportunity to talk with you about this new law. Um, we're here for you if you have additional questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, so we're glad to follow up um, after the fact. And uh, we wish you all the best for a very happy, healthy, safe, and secure 2021. Thanks so much.